All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Amen. Good to hear some of you out there this morning. I can tell the ones that had a cup of coffee this morning and the ones that didn't uh, by how you express that. Well, I'm glad that you made the choice to be here at church this morning. It's great to see everybody here. And uh, if Pastor is watching on the live stream in this morning, I was going to crack a joke about cruise ships, but I thought I'll steer clear of icebergs this morning. And so we'll leave the cruise ship jokes aside. But let's take our Bibles this morning and let's open to the book of Ruth in the Old Testament this morning. The book of Ruth in the Old Testament. You'll find that right after the book of Judges and right before you get into 1 Samuel. You'll find it sandwiched in there, only a short book, just four chapters, but the book of Ruth this morning is where we'll be, and we'll look right at chapter 1, chapter 1 and verse 1 of the book of Ruth for this morning. Ruth and chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible reads, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Look at verse 2. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Marlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now, I'm sure everybody here this morning is familiar with the character in the Bible, Ruth, and we're probably most familiar with the general picture of her story. But this morning, our message is going to be right here in chapter one. So if you'd keep your Bible open for the entire message, we're pretty much just going to be here exclusively. And we're going to learn a couple of things here from Ruth and chapter one. But before we get to what we're going to learn this morning, as we By way of introduction this morning, understand that the book of Ruth was most likely written by the prophet Samuel. Now, we're familiar with Samuel. Samuel was a prophet during the reign of primarily King Saul. And uh, he actually penned several books there with 1st and 2nd Samuel and some of the chronicled books later on. But it was most likely written by Samuel the prophet after Ruth and the characters in this story had actually passed away. So it was written after it had taken place. Now, most likely, we we note that the book of Ruth actually took place, not when it was written, but actually took place in the time of the Judges. And we saw that in verse 1 there. Now, what was the time of Judges? Well, the time of Judges was the time in between when Israel had come into the Promised Land and when they had their first king. We're familiar with the first king of Israel, and that was Saul. When God's people, they said, we want a king. We want to be like all the other countries. Give us a king. And so God gave them Saul. And so this takes place in that period in between that when the judges ruled in Israel. Now, to help us pinpoint a little more specifically when the book of Ruth takes place, we know by reasoning and by reading other passages of scripture that it took place most likely after Ehud successfully fought against the Moabites in Judges chapter 3. Because prior to that, Israel and Moab were at war, and so people wouldn't move freely backwards and forwards between Moab and Israel until after Ehud had fought against the Moabites and there was a time of relative peace there. Some of you may remember the story of Ehud. The Bible tells us he was a left-handed man, and he stabbed with a dagger the king Eglon of Moab. And you can find that in Judges chapter 3. So we know that it's sometime after that and and sometime before Saul was king. Now, most uh, Bible scholars would pinpoint it right around the time of Gideon, right around the time of Gideon, because of the relationships that were taking place with Moab and Israel. But suffice to say, we know that it was in that period of time. We also have a clue at the end of the book of Ruth. You don't have to turn there, but in chapter 4, we see the genealogies. And again, I'm sure most of you would be familiar with the fact that Ruth had a son by the name of Obed and Obed had a son by the name of Jesse and then Jesse had a son by the name of David and we're all familiar with David's father Jesse and David would become king of Israel so we know that there was just three generations between Ruth 
and her family and King David. So it's right there in that period of time. As I said, it's just a short book, only four chapters long. You might ask, well, what can we learn from this book? Well, there's a lot that we can learn from the story of Ruth. And we know that nothing's in the Bible by accident. Now, another interesting fact to note about the book of Ruth is that this is one of only two books in the Bible that's named after a woman. The other one being Esther, also in the Old Testament that tells the story of Queen Esther. And so we have the book of Ruth, one of only two that are named after a woman. And this book, as I said, follows the story of Ruth. But there are other players and other characters that come into the book of Ruth. And so our question for this morning is, well, what are we going to learn from chapter one? What can we learn as Christians today in 2022 from Ruth and chapter one? Well, there's many things, as I said, but primarily this morning, I want us to look at the subject of choices. Choices. And so I've titled the message this morning, Choices, We All Make Them. Choices, we all make them. See, our lives are full of choices every day. As I said, you've made the choice to be here at church this morning. You made the choice to get out of bed, or maybe the alarm clock forced you out of bed this morning. But we've made a choice to be here. You make a choice where you live. You make a choice what car to drive. You make a choice of where you'll work. You'll make a choice of what you eat for lunch afterwards. And most notably, we know as Christians that we make a choice on eternity. We make a choice that we will trust Christ as Saviour. We make that choice and we know that making no choice at all is still making a choice. And so those that reject Christ as Saviour still make a choice one way or the other. And so we know that our lives are full of these choices where we exercise our will to determine our path and our course of action. And so there are many examples and If you look right through the Bible, the Bible is a great record of all the choices that individuals made. And it's written mostly uh, from other people's points of view. And so we have commentary on the lives and the choices that people make. And we see the results of their choices. We see those that made bad choices, as we're going to see this morning, we see the consequences of that. Now, there are different things that can happen when we make choices. Sometimes... We make choices that are wrong and we receive punishment and correction from God or from our authorities in this world. We receive consequences for that. Then there are also just natural consequences for dumb decisions we make in life. And who, who's been there before? You've made a, a bad decision and you've reaped the consequences. Well, I can tell you a time when I was in high school. We were on a high school camp up in Foster and many of you would be familiar with Wallace Lake in Foster. It's a huge lake. I'm not exactly sure how wide it is, but it's a couple kilometres wide. And so we are up there on a high school camp and myself, my brother and some others, we thought it would be a fantastic idea to get inflatable mattresses and to try and sail across Wallace Lake. Bad decision. And we decided it would be a good idea and it would be safe. It was relatively flat. So we pumped up the mattresses and we got on them and we started to go across. And we got a little ways across And we started to realise that this was going to take a whole lot longer than we thought it would. Because every time you you go a little ways, the other side just gets further and further away. And so we were going for for hours. And we we got out to the middle of Wallace Lake and there was a small island there. And we thought, well, we'll stop here. This is a good place to get out and explore. And we went around the island for quite a while. And then we realised something. And that's we've got to go all the way back again. There's no way off this island and there's no boats around, no one's around, no one has phones or anything. So then we had to go all the way back a couple hours on these blow-up mattresses, just paddling with our hands and we had one little broken paddle. And it was a terrible decision. But we look back and we laugh at it and we say, what was I thinking? And we do that all the time in life. We, We sometimes just reap the consequences of our own bad decisions, just dumb things that we do. But we all make choices in life. And there's something that is interesting for us to note as we get to our message this morning, that we can choose our choices in life, but we don't get to choose the consequences. We can make whatever choice we want to. God's given us the freedom to do that. And living in the country that we do, most of the time we enjoy the freedom to just do whatever we like. But we don't get to choose 
what will follow after we choose to do whatever we like to do. And we're going to see that in our message this morning. So as we look at the story of Ruth, I want us to consider, as I said this morning, the choices that we make in life. Let's pray and then we'll get to the message. Father, we do thank you for an opportunity to look here at your word this morning. Lord, I thank you for this passage of scripture. And Lord, what great truths we can learn from it. And Lord, I pray this morning as we look at this passage and as we learn the lessons that you would have us to learn, Father, I pray that you would help us to make wise choices in our lives. Lord, choices that are thoughtful and well-considered, Lord, that would depend upon you. Lord, that would trust you for the best in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts today, Lord, in a way that only you can. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to each one through your word. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we read the first two verses here of the book of Ruth and we saw, firstly, in there we see the man Elimelech. And so firstly this morning I want us to consider as we think about the choices we make, Elimelech's decision. Elimelech's decision. We see there in verse 1 that it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. So we see the man Elimelech and we're introduced to him by name in verse 2. And we see there that he lives in a place called Bethlehem Judah. And that simply is just the city of Bethlehem in the place of Judah in southern Israel. Just south of the city of Jerusalem and we know that that's ultimately where David lived further on and we know that even further forwards that that's where Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem a little city up on the side of the mountain there in southern Israel and so they were residents as we see there it says and it uses the word Bethlehemite Uh, sorry I'm reading the wrong verse there it says that they're from Bethlehem Judah and it says they're Ephrathites and that just simply means that they were citizens of that place so they were citizens and they lived there in Bethlehem in Judah in southern Israel And so they had quite a history there. They'd lived there for a long time. And we see that he makes the decision to go on a trip to Moab. And we're going to see in just a moment that there's several reasons for that trip, most of which were not bad reasons. But he makes a decision, a trip to Moab. Now, where was Moab? Well, Moab, if you look at a map of Israel and if you pinpoint Judah and if you pinpoint Bethlehem on a map, you'll see that the city or the country of Moab, rather, is right across the Dead Sea from where Bethlehem is. Just across the other side of the Dead Sea in what today would be known as Jordan. And we'd probably be familiar with that. So Moab is what is modern day Jordan. And from Bethlehem, it wasn't a necessarily long journey. We're talking only 50 miles. But what made it much harder was that back then, a journey like that would have been done on foot. And so they would have walked that trip and that would have taken them Roughly, most would estimate seven to ten days of solid walking. So maybe they would have made some some stops along the way and it would have been a couple weeks, perhaps. But it was a long walk. And what made it a longer walk than what it should have been was the fact that you can't cross over the Dead Sea. That's not something they would do. So to walk there, you'd have to go around the Dead Sea, either the north way or the south way. And both were pretty difficult. It's very mountainous and rough. And it's steep terrain. It's actually a very dangerous trip to take. But as I said, it would have taken them quite a while. So you'd want to have a good reason to take a trip like that. That's not somewhere you'd just go for a holiday. Go for a a two-week walk through dangerous and rugged terrain where there could have been thieves, where there could have been people who would rob you and steal, as was common in those days. To take a long journey like that, you would only do out of necessity. That was something that would only be done out of necessity. So we see that they take a trip there over to the country of Moab. Now, just take a step back for a moment and let's consider who were the Moabites. Well, we would know the Moabites, their descendants of none other than Moab. And who was Moab? Well, Moab, as some may know this already, but Moab was the child of Lot that he had through incest with his eldest daughter after they'd left Sodom. And so they were cursed and so they became known as the Moabites and they went there and dwelt on the other side of the Dead Sea. And we remember the story of Lot, how uh, 
He was in the city of Sodom and God sent two angels in to take them out. The angels came and they left the city. And we remember Lot's wife, how she turned back and she became a pillar of salt. And most Bible commentators commenting on that instance said that uh, after leaving Sodom, Lot's wife became a little bit salty. There's a couple of dads in the room having a laugh. I'm allowed to crack those jokes now. But so we know that after she became a pillar of salt, Lot didn't have a wife and through circumstance, Lot found himself in a cave up on the side of a mountain, displaced. And then we know what happened there with his daughters. And he had a child by his eldest and his youngest daughter. And the oldest one was Moab. And so one of the sons founded the country of Moab and the other one was Amnon, which, or Amon, which was another enemy of Israel. So it wasn't a good ending there but so we know that the son was Moab and so the descendants they were pagans they were estranged from Israel they were estranged from the God of Israel they served other gods and oftentimes as you can read earlier in the book of Judges they were at war with God's people there was fighting going on backwards and forwards for different reasons and so as a as an Israelite and as someone particularly who lived in Judah and a family who followed God this was not a good place to go to this is not the place you wanted to go But we know that they did nonetheless take a trip to Moab. And so, as I said, firstly this morning, I want us to see Elimelech's decision. And there's three things that I see here in this passage concerning his decision. The first one, the first reason for going to Moab was it was a physical decision. We saw there in verse 1 that there was a famine in the land of Judah. There was a famine. So this was a physical decision. There was a famine. There was no food. And a famine in those times had major impacts upon society. If there's no food, that means work is down. Jobs are less. It affects all aspects of society. And so it was a physical decision. He made the decision based on physical reasoning. He was looking out at where he was living and seeing the supermarket shelves were getting empty. There was no food to feed the family. And perhaps Elimelech even worked in agriculture. And maybe the the work just wasn't there for him. And so he makes this physical decision to go to Moab because of the famine. But not only do I see it was a physical decision, but it was a temporary decision. And we see that again in verse 1 where the Bible says he went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now the word sojourn means temporary. It was just a temporary trip. Elimelech's thinking was, I'll go over there to Moab and we'll stay there for maybe few weeks months the famine will pass and we'll come back so it was a temporary decision he had every intention of it only being a short trip but it's interesting as we think about that that that's not a good way to make decisions and choices in our lives just looking at the temporary and not thinking about the long term oftentimes we do that all the time in our lives we make decisions looking at the next few weeks and we fail to think about the repercussions that that could have months and years down the track. And so Elimelech's decision was a temporary decision. But not only was it a temporary decision, but the Bible points out for us as well at the end of verse 2 that the family went, and it says, and continued there. So this decision that Elimelech made to go down or across to Moab, it affected the whole family. This was a family decision. This impacted his wife, Naomi, and as we're going to find out, his sons, Marlon and Chilion as well. It had repercussions. And so as we think about this passage and we put ourselves into our view, we must realise that our actions and choices always affect other people. Always. No, No one here in the room this morning lives in a vacuum. We all have families. We are all part of a church family. We all have workplaces and we come into contact with people all the time. And so none of us live in a vacuum. And so we have to realise that as we make decisions in life and we make choices in life, our actions always affect the lives of those around us. Always. And we see that here in chapter 1, that Elimelech made this decision and he had reasons for it. There was a physical reason for it. He thought it will just be a short trip down to Moab. It won't be forever. But it affected everybody in his family. So we see his decision to go to Moab. But not only do we see his decision, but secondly this morning, I want us to see here 
Elimelech's decease. Elimelech's decease. Look there at verse 3. The Bible reads, And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. So Elimelech goes over there to Moab, and they've been there. The Bible doesn't tell us how long, but the assumption here is that it's only a short while they've been there in Moab, and Elimelech dies. Now, we don't know how he died. The Bible doesn't tell us. It could have been an accident. It could have been a working accident. He could have been killed by somebody else. He may have contracted some disease or illness and passed away. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how he died, but we do know one thing. He died. And so a couple of thoughts regarding the death of Elimelech. Firstly, it was an unplanned event. Elimelech wasn't planning to die. When Elimelech left Israel and went over there to Moab, he wasn't planning on coming back in a body bag. That wasn't his intention or being buried even in Moab. That wasn't what he was thinking. He was thinking this is just a temporary thing. This is just a short trip. I'll go over there and I'll come back and everything will be fine. But we know that our lives are full of unplanned events. And so when we make choices and decisions in life, we have to realize that unplanned things do happen in our lives. Illness, loss of work, family troubles, society problems, all these things affect us. And we have to realize that we're not in control of as many things that we think we're in control of. And so unplanned events take place. And so we see that his death was unplanned. But not only was it unplanned, but it was unforeseen. Elimelech didn't see this in his future. When he went off there to Moab, he wasn't even thinking about dying. He wasn't thinking that his life might just be about to end. Because had he known that, I don't think he would have taken the trip, would he? So it was an unforeseen event. But then thirdly, it was also an upheaving event. And it turned the lives of the whole family upside down. So when Elimelech was there, he was leading the family. He was leading them along all the way there to Moab. And he was the provider and he was the protector of the family. But now he's gone, the whole family's turned upside down. It's just Naomi and the two sons. And again, as we'll see in just a moment, the sons weren't that old at this, uh, at this point. And we'll find out in just a moment why. But it turned the lives of the whole family upside down. And this was unforeseen, it was unplanned for. They didn't expect to be in Moab and now all alone, living in a foreign country with foreign people who didn't necessarily like them particularly, where there was no work for them, where it was hard. And so we see that Elimelech's decease caused some problems. But not only do we see Elimelech's decision to go to Moab and we see his decease, but we see his descendants, Elimelech's descendants, thirdly this morning. Look down at verse 4, will you? Verse 4 of Ruth chapter 1, the Bible says, And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there, see that phrase, about 10 years. About 10 years. So we see here Elimelech's descendants, his two sons, Marlon and Chilion. We read about them in verse 2. And we don't have a whole lot in the Bible about these two men. Everything that's recorded in the Bible is here just in these couple of verses here. And they're only mentioned by name twice in the scriptures. Twice they're mentioned, Marlon and Chilion. And we see here that they decided to take wives of the women of Moab. And so three things I see here about the sons of Elimelech, Marlon and Chilion, was firstly they were affected by the decision of their father. They were affected by the decision of their father. And all of us in the room here this morning are sons of a father. And we are affected directly and indirectly by the decisions of our father. And that should be a challenge to us uh, well, those who are parents and, and even myself expecting a child now, that should remind us that how we deal with our kids will affect their future. How we deal with our children will affect their future and they will be affected by even the small decisions that we make each and every day. So we see that they were affected by the decision of their father. They were in a foreign country, in the land of Moab. They probably didn't even want to be there. They had no friends. The people they grew up with were gone. Their family was gone. Their father was gone. And they're in a strange country. 
But not only were they affected by the decisions of their father, they were affected by their own decision making as well. And that is a challenge for us all that we can't just blame our circumstances on the decisions of another. We're all responsible for our own choices. Regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in life, we can't just pass the buck and blame someone else. We are all individually accountable for the decisions that we make. And so they made their own decision. And you would ask, well, what was their decision? Well, we read it there in verse 4 that they took them wives of the women of Moab. That was their choice. No one told them to do it. They made a choice. And we know that that is not a good choice. And you would ask, well, why? Well, if you look back, we won't go there now for time. But if you look at Deuteronomy in chapter 7, God, when speaking to the children of Israel, gives them guidelines for who the young men and women should marry. And the guidelines were very clear and specific that for reasons that God gave that they should not marry women and men from the neighbouring countries that didn't follow God. And God gives them a reason there because he says that the women or the men would turn the heart of the spouse towards foreign gods. And so God gave them clear direction that they shouldn't do that and we know that they would have been familiar with that. Marlon and Chilion, growing up in Judah, they would have heard that regularly repeated to them, that this is not something that they should do, that they should not take wives of the neighbouring countries, but they did it anyway. And so we know that they're affected by their own decisions. They could have made a decision to go back to Judah. They could have made that decision. That was within their power now as young men. They could have said, Mum... We're going back to Judah. We think that's the right thing to do. But they chose to stay and they chose to marry and to settle. And so we see that they marry Orpah and Ruth and they're there for 10 years. 10, about 10 years. That's a long time. Cast your mind back to where you were 10 years ago and think about how much has changed since then. But they were there for 10 years roughly. And then we see in verse 5, Look at verse 5, the Bible reads, And Marlon and Chilion died, also both of them. And the woman, that was Naomi, was left of her two sons and her husband. So we see that they were affected by the decisions of their father. They were affected by their own decisions. But three, they were appreh apprehended by death. And we know that no one escapes death. No one escapes death. And so their time was, was finished. Their time for life was over. And again, as relatively young men, and we know that the age of men marrying at that time was much younger than the norms of today. They would have been married in their late teens, early 20s at latest. We know that they would have only been roughly around the age of 30 when they passed away. And so again, probably much like their father, we're not planning on living such short lives, but it reminds us that there are no guarantees in life. We often feel like, and myself very much included, that we have some indefinite amount of time here on this earth. We prepare and we plan and we hope and we, we wish that we're just going to be here forever and we just never see death in our future. But the reality is all of us have a time where it is appointed for us to die. And so death came knocking on the door of Marlon and Chilion and they died there in Moab. And we see there that Naomi was left with no sons and no husband. So we have Naomi, who started in Judah. There was a famine, she went with the family. And they all gone to Moab, and now everyone's died except for her. She's the last one standing. And so we see Naomi's return back home. Naomi's return back home. So we've seen this morning, we've seen Elimelech's decision. He made a bad decision. It was physical, it was temporary, and it affected his family. We've seen that he died. He wasn't expecting it. He was not thinking about death, but he died nonetheless. And we see his sons, that they were affected by their own decisions and by the bad decisions of others around them. And they too die. And lastly, this morning, we see Naomi returning home. That should excite your heart. Naomi returning home, but that this is the last point of the message this morning. Naomi's return home. Some thoughts about Naomi going back home. Let's look at verse 6. Look down in your Bible at verse 6. The Bible reads, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. 
For she had heard in the country of Moab, notice this, how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. See that God had met with his people there in Israel. See Elimelech's lack of faith that God could provide for his people was shown up here. And we see that word travelled even as far as Moab, that the Lord had blessed his people, that there was rain, there was crops, there was food, the famine was over. And so we see God directing, God directing Naomi back to Bethlehem, giving them bread. And so we see there in verse 7 that Naomi leaves. The Bible reads, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. Verse 8, the Bible reads, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. Now, as a man... When I read this passage, I I picture this very clearly in my mind. Three women having a a conversation together and the tears begin to flow. And and that's a pretty common thing, isn't it? But we see the women there, they they begin to have this conversation. And Naomi says to the two daughters, Ruth and Orpah, you should go back home. Don't follow me back to Israel. Don't follow me all the way back home. Just go and find rest in, in the houses of your families. Find husbands here in the land of Moab. And so she tells them to stay, but the Bible reads in verse 10, and they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. So they said, We don't want to stay here in Moab anymore. We want to go back with you to Bethlehem. Naomi, we're staying with you. And that's a a nice picture there we see of their commitment to Naomi. They want to go back with her. But we see there again, Naomi says, Turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes, that the hand of the Lord is gone out, against me. So we see Naomi's got some strong reasons here for why they should stay in Moab. And we just read it briefly there. She tells them just to go back. She says, I'm not going to have any more children. Even if I got married today, the children are going to be 18, 20 years away. And there's no chance that you're going to wait another 20 years to get married again. And so she tells them, just, just go back home. She says, it grieves me for your sakes. Naomi's grieved. She felt sorry for them. She didn't want them to come with her. She said, just stay here. Just go back to the life that you have. Go make the best of life that you can. And so we see that Naomi declares that they should go back. But then we see Orpah's departure in verse 14. The Bible tells us that Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and she left. But the Bible says there that Ruth clave unto her. So Orpah, after this conversation they've had backwards and forwards, where Naomi said, look, you should go. They said, no, we're going to come with you. And then Naomi says again, look, it's not a good idea. Don't come with me. Go find new husbands, marry again, have families, have children. And then we see Orpah says, okay, I'll I'll go back. And so she leaves and she goes back. But we see Ruth's devotion. The Bible says Ruth clave unto her. Ruth clave unto Naomi. And then we see Ruth's devotion displayed very clearly. And and this is probably one of the most famous passages we know in the book of Ruth. Where Ruth says to Naomi this great thing. Look there at verse 16. We're about to draw the message to a close. The Bible says in, in Ruth chapter 1 and 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. 
And the Bible says in 18, verse 18 there, when she saw, that's Naomi, that she, that's Ruth, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And what a great passage that is that Ruth declares her devotion to Naomi. But not only her devotion to Naomi, but her devotion to the true God of the Bible. And that's something interesting to think about, that even though Naomi had spent more than 10 years now in the country of Moab, she had not adopted the gods of the Moabites. She had still been setting a consistent example for those around her. Because we see there that at the end of verse 16, that Ruth says, thy God, my God. And so throughout that time, Naomi must have been demonstrating faith in the true and living God for Ruth to say, I want what you've got. I want to worship the God that you have. And so we see the faith of of Naomi and the family. They didn't follow the God of the Moabites in their time there. But it's a great passage, isn't it? And it, it causes us to think about many things. People talk about this passage in the context of marriage. People talk about it in the context of salvation and and people talk about it in the context of surrender of giving everything and following after god but we see ruth's devotion clearly spelled out and then bringing the chapter to a close we see naomi's distress when she gets back to bethlehem in judah the bible tells us that the people they see her and they say is this naomi Wow, after all these years, Naomi's back. More than 10 years, they they recognize her. You know when you see an old face, someone you haven't seen for for years, and you see them and you still instantly recognize them. Oh, that's this person. And that's how it was for her. She comes back and they say, "This this is Naomi. And Naomi stops them and she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. And we we read that and we think maybe that's a strange thing. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And and we think that that's a bit strange. Why would she change her name? But you have to understand that back in this time, people were named for a reason. It wasn't like today where we just go on Google and we find the top trending name and and we just name our child that. Back, Back in this time, names had significant meaning. And the name Naomi meant pleasantness or sweetness. And so that was what defined her as a person. That's how her family thought of her when they named her. And so by calling her Naomi, they were calling her pleasantness or or sweetness. And she says, don't call me pleasant anymore. She says, God hath dealt very bitterly with me. And we could preach a whole message just from that about bitterness and the dangers of bitterness in our lives, how it can spring up and it can choke us. And this wasn't a good response from Naomi. She says, call me Mara, which means bitterness. Naomi became bitter through this. She was distressed. And so she says, don't call me that anymore. She says, I went out full in verse 21 and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me and the Almighty hath afflicted me. And so we see then in verse 22, and this is the last verse we'll read for this morning. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. We see there that Naomi's response was to blame God for her troubles. She says, God hath dealt bitterly against me. This is God's doing. God's cursed me. And so just call me bitter. And and she allowed that to define her. So she was distressed. So we've seen through chapter 1 what takes place here this morning. And you might be wondering, well, how does this tie in with what, what we talked about in the introduction this morning, with the choices that we make? So in conclusion this this morning, I want to give you five choices that were made in the story here in Ruth and chapter 1. Five choices from the five main characters. I'll give them to you quite briefly and then we'll be finished for this morning. But I want you to, as we go through these, see how you fit into this. Perhaps there are times in your life where this has been you and you've been one of these five people. Firstly, we see Elimelech. Well, what did Elimelech choose? Amongst other things, he chose to prioritise the physical. Elimelech, we could characterise his whole life. We could summarise it by saying that he just chose to exalt the physical. 
He, he thought about his family. He thought about providing for his family, which is not a bad thing. But he, he only could see the physical things in life. He could only see having enough food, having work to get by, having shelter. But he failed to see the spiritual things in life. And he failed to think about the implications that it would have on his family, uprooting them and going to a foreign country. And we see that God did provide bread for his people. And so Elimelech should have just stayed there in his home place and not moved away. It had catastrophic consequences for him, but Elimelech chose to just prioritise the physical. And I'm afraid, myself very much included, we do that all the time, don't we? We prioritise the physical things of life. We prioritise having a good job. We prioritise having a car. We prioritise the things that we want to do, our own achievements, and we fail to see the things that God has for us in our life. We, we miss out completely on what God has for us because we're just caught up on the, on the physical. We, we learn in 2 Timothy, the Bible says that no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. We become entangled with the physical and so we have to be careful. When riches increase, the Bible says our heart can be taken away. And so we live in a very comfortable society and so we have to remember that when we make decisions and choices in life, this should not be the main motivator for our decisions. We shouldn't only think about the physical. We should consider the spiritual and what God has for us. So we see Elimelech chose to prioritise the physical. But then we see Naomi chose to view her life through her circumstances. And you say, well, how did she do that? Well, we see at the start, Naomi was happy. Her name was pleasant. And she was happily married to Elimelech and they had two lovely sons, Marlon and Chilion, and she was happy. And when everything was going well in Moab, she was happy. But then we see when the tables turned and life wasn't going her way, she said, just, just call me bitter. I'm angry at God. I'm angry at everybody. Don't call me my name anymore. Just call me bitter. I'm angry. And so she chose to view her life through her circumstances. If times were good, she was happy. And if times were bad, well, she was bitter and angry. And boy, that's not a good way to go through life. God doesn't want us to go through life being defined by our circumstances. We all go through different trials and challenges in life, but that's not who we are. We're children of God, and he's called us and given us all the things we need in his word to live godly lives and to live victorious lives, to live joyful lives, to live hope-filled lives. And we don't have to just live through life just being defined and allowing our circumstances and our emotions in those circumstances to define us and to view and to, to be the way we view our life. If times are good, I'm happy. If times are bad, I'm sad. That's not a good way to go through life. In fact, that's how, that's how unsaved people go through life. When times are good, I'm, I'm happy, I'm glad, I'm joyful. But when times are bad... I'll get mad and sad. And that's not how God calls us to be. So Naomi chose to view her life through her circumstances. But then we see thirdly that Marlon and Chilion, well, what did they choose? They chose, I believe, to be indifferent. Their choice was to be indifferent. And this is perhaps the most dangerous out of all of them. They chose to just, well, whatever happens, happens. You know, well, we're here in Moab. We may as well just get married here. We'll, we'll find the nicest girls here in Moab. We'll marry them. We'll just settle down here and what can we do? And I know that in my own life, I find myself slipping into this trap often. Oftentimes we adopt just that attitude towards life, towards serving God. Oh, well, well I'll get round to it when I can. I'll, I'll go and, and go soul winning when I can. I'll tell my co-worker about Christ. Okay, when we get a chance to do it, we become indifferent. And that was Marlon and Chilion. They chose just to not really care about anything. Oh, well, too bad. We'll serve God later on. And we know that that's a bad choice to make because we don't know what a day brings forth, do we? We don't know what our life entails. We don't know if today will be our last day. So being indifferent is very dangerous very dangerous and it can spell our undoing. So we saw that Elimelech chose to prioritise the physical 
Naomi chose to view her life through her circumstances. We see that Marlon and Chilion chose to be indifferent to their circumstances. Then we have two more and we'll be finished. We see Orpah. Orpah chose to listen to the wrong voices. Orpah chose to listen to the wrong voices. And you say, well, how did she do that? Well, quite simply, Orpah was inclined to follow Naomi back to Israel. We saw that in the story. Her initial inclination was to go back with them. She said, I'll go with you. But after that conversation with Naomi, she turned away and she went back to Moab. And you say, well, how is that listening to the wrong voice? Well, she chose to listen to Naomi when Naomi was bitter. When Naomi was bitter and in a place where she couldn't make a, a right decision and give good counsel. The counsel that Naomi gave was flawed. It, it was in a time where she was unstable and she was bitter and angry. And so she told them to go back. And so what Orpah should have done is just like Ruth, she should have just persisted and she should have gone back again with them. And life would have been very different for her if she had done that. She shouldn't have listened to Naomi when Naomi was in a state of distress. But she chose to listen. And we could put ourselves right in there again, couldn't we? There's so many voices in the world. There's so many voices out there that, that try and tell us, do this, do that, live like this, go here, try this, listen to this, watch this. And we can be instead so easily with the wrong voices. We listen to those around us. We get advice off our friends. And we, we fail to listen to what really matters, the word of God. We fail to listen to that. So we see Orpah chose to listen to the wrong voices. But then lastly, this morning, the fifth and final choice was Ruth. And what did Ruth choose? Well, Ruth chose to leave everything in total surrender to whatever would happen following that. Ruth didn't know what would happen going back to Israel. Ruth had probably never been to Israel. More than likely, she would have known many Israelites. Probably Naomi was the only one she knew. She hadn't known what it was like to live in a society where people were following God, where they weren't worshipping idols. She hadn't experienced any of that. All she knew was Moab. But she chose to leave everything in total surrender to God. And what a great choice that you and I could make. To, to choose to be like Ruth and to choose just to give everything to God. And so when it comes to the choices we make in life, rather than like Elimelech choosing what's comfortable for us, rather than being like Naomi and choosing to be defined by our circumstances rather than being like Marlon and Chilion and just being indifferent to everything, rather than being like Orpah and listening to the wrong voices, we could choose to be like Ruth and just to give it all to God and say, Lord, my, my life's yours. You can have it all. Take everything and totally surrender to him. And those of you who know the, the end of the book of Ruth, you'll know that Things worked out okay for Ruth. <coughs> Things worked out quite all right. And she ended up becoming part of the royal line of David. And we know that the descendants of David is what brought for Mary and Joseph. And of Mary was born Christ. And she became part of the line of Christ because of what she chose. How she chose to just leave everything and just give it all to the Lord. And say, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm willing to give it all to the Lord. And so as we think about the choices that we make in life each and every day, right from the smallest ones all the way up to the biggest choices that we make in life, the big life-shaping decisions, we should strive to have the attitude of Ruth where we just give everything to God, where we present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Because God's given us everything. He's given us everything we need and his word. He's given us everything we need to get through life and not just to survive, but to do well. God doesn't have us here just to make it through by the skin of our teeth. We don't have to get through life like that, just going from trouble to trouble and disappointment to disappointment. God wants to give us victory through our lives. And so we don't have to go through life 
being indifferent or just thinking about the physical, we can just give everything to God. And he'll help us make the right decisions. He gives us everything we need. He's faithful. He proves himself time and time again. And so we would just do well to give everything to him and say, Lord, my life's yours. Just take everything. And when it comes to making choices in life, allow him to direct. Don't make decisions based on what you see in front of you. Don't make decisions based on what other people tell you. But always come back to what what does God's word tell me to do? What's the right thing to do? What does God want me to do in my life? Because that's the path to true blessing, where we choose to just leave everything and surrender totally to him. Father, we do thank you for this passage of scripture. Lord, I pray this morning that you'd help each one here. Lord, that you would help us to be totally surrendered to you. Lord, that just like Ruth, we would leave everything in your hands. Lord, that we would be willing to follow. Lord, to be led by you. Lord, I ask that you would help us to beware of the pitfalls that lie in our way so often. Lord, the entanglements and the snares that we find in life. Lord, the physical possessions and things that we have. Lord, those around us who whose voices chime in and who seek to pull us away from where we're meant to be. Lord, I ask that you would protect us from these things. And Lord, help us to have a heart just like Ruth, where we would surrender all to you and give our whole lives to you and allow you to determine our path. Lord, I pray that you would speak to each heart here this morning. Lord, help us to remember these things as we go from here. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, this time.